Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Beck2 and the Rough Assembly present a conversation with picture and sound assistants. Uh, this panel session is in um, collaboration with Beck2's uh, hashtag Wednesday workshops, uh, which we're going to be putting on until the foreseeable future, hopefully, um, in order to give all you lovely people um, some content whilst we're all at home. Um, we have an amazing panel this evening, which um, our chair, um, Steve Fanagan, uh, is going to be running. Um, my name is Nia Hughes. I look after the post-production and facilities branch. Um, so have had the pleasure of um, kind of working on all of these with, um, with the Back to Post uh, committee. Um, if uh, if we could just get a couple of house um, house rules down, that would be a really amazing. So uh, this is a webinar, uh, which means that you uh, can put something in the chat function, uh, but also you can put something in the Q and A function. So what we ask, please, if is if you can just um, stick the chatting and the bants and the links and everything like that into the chat function. Um, and at the end, we'll be doing a Q&A. So if you could please put every questions that you have in there, they won't be, be they won't be being picked up from, um, from the chat function. Um, and in terms of those Q&A uh, questions, sorry, if you could just keep them quite direct and to the point because um, it's exceptionally hot in everyone's room. Um, and so uh, the last post sound, post sound discussion went on for about three hours. Uh, whereas this evening, I just don't think that any of us are going to be able to uh, uh, deal with that in 26 or 27 uh, degree heat. So, okay. Um, if I could now pass you on to the wonderful Steve uh, Fanagan. Thanks, Mia. Hi everyone, uh, welcome. So the title for tonight's event is a conversation between assistant editors from the picture and sound departments. Um, and so we've got a really brilliant panel in front of us, um, people with a lot of experience. And uh, we're just looking forward to talking about how we work together um, through the course of a film or a TV show. So just to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way, uh, the Rough Assembly is the website for everyone that joins the post-production and facilities branch of Back2, uh, of which I'm a member. Uh, our branch is currently actively involved in uh, with the discussion and the development of the BFC Back to Work document. So the union is working on all of our behalf to try and figure out how we're all going to get back to work safely. Um, my name is Steve Fanagan and I'm a freelance sound designer, a supervising sound editor and a sound recording mixer. Uh, for tonight's discussion, my colleague Steve Little uh, has kindly assembled uh, this, this panel for us. Um, so let me just give you a quick brief introduction to each of the panelists and, and then I'll hand you over to them to talk about all the brilliant work they do. So from the sound department end of things, we have Joe Jackson and Joe's recent credits include James Bond, No Time to Die, Radioactive, which we worked on together and The Dark Crystal. Uh, we have Louise Burton, uh, whose recent credits include Bohemian Rhapsody and Alan Holmes and His House. We have James Shirley, whose recent credits include Cats, The Dark Crystal and Luther. Um, and then from the assistant picture editor side of things, we have Robert Duffield, uh, whose credits include Pennyworth Season 2, The Dark Crystal and Rogue One. Uh, we have Lydia Mannering, uh, whose credits include Bohemian Rhapsody, The Crown Series 4 and The Dark Crystal. And we have Sam Hodge, whose credits include Cats, Early Man and Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. So we kind of got an interesting thing where we have some crossover on projects between people. So hopefully we'll be able to talk about how these guys work together on those shows, as well as sort of attempting, I suppose, to give a broad introduction to what everyone does in their day to day and how they communicate and interact with one another. That. So I'm going to start with the picture side of things. So I want to do a kind of a basic intro to what the role of a picture assistant is. And I was going to start with Robert. Who, Robert, if you could maybe give us a bit of an intro to your work on feature films, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I thought I'd sort of 
say a few words about what a first assistant editor does in case some people in the group in the participants didn't know. So sort of first assistant on feature films. I've written a succinct thing here, so I'm just gonna read it. Uh, so yeah, basically, first of all, you're gonna be helping the editor creatively and technically. And that'll be um, helping with the edit, perhaps creatively if requested, track laying sound effects on the edit and music and kind of taking notes and addressing those um, notes with, with, with new music, say. Uh, and then, you know, things like importing media for, for the edit. Uh, if, if, if there's a, a particular song somebody wants, find it, import it. Generally helping out um, with, the, with any sort of editor's requests. And then um, there's another side of it, which is managing and organizing uh, the AVID project, which would be sort of maintaining the AVID project and the background media to make sure it's all very neat and tidy and you can always access everything at all times in case something wants, somebody wants something from the first day of production. You'd be like, oh yes, I know what that is. Um, and then day to day, you'd be sort of... Uh, working through rushes, creating scene bins for the editor, making sure the rushes are technically okay, uh, calling out anything if there's a problem with any rushes. And then um, generally on a day-to-day, -day, you're kind of, after the principal photography is done, you're maintaining all the exports and the turnovers to the different departments. And I'm sure we're gonna get into what a turnover is uh, with the sound guys here. And then you're managing the cutting room as well. so if you've got multiple members of staff, maybe there's more than one first assistant editor, you've got to kind of manage workload as to who does what to make sure people aren't kind of joint doing work. And then um, a really important thing is you've got to make sure that all the departments, the sound department, the music department, the grade, VFX, well, maybe not so much VFX unless you're doing VFX as well, but you've got to make sure they're all got the right edit. They're all working to the same hymn sheet. Because if somebody's working on something that's old and somebody's working on something new, you put it together and it's, it's not in sync. And we've all had moments like that where you're like, oh my God, we've got to, <laughs> we've got to like work out what's happened here. And then other than that, you've got to sort of liaise with the post supervisor, producers and the studio to kind of manage uh, requests and, and come up with realistic deadlines really. And so your sort of overview of the whole thing, I would say. Perfect. So maybe what we'll do is just move on to Lydia. And we, Lydia, would you mind giving a little bit of an introduction to your work, maybe on a TV series in a similar way? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I'm a second assistant, and uh, I worked on Dark Crystal, and I'm now working on The Crown as a second assistant. And a second assistant sort of does exactly the sort of the same, you're basically you're uh, under the first assistant. So the first assistant will be in charge of bringing um, all the media in and stuff like that. And so the second assistant will sort of work with the first assistant really in bringing in the media, um, searching for searching for music, searching for sound effects. Uh, the real difference between a television edit, uh, assistant editor and a film assistant editor is that with a television editor you have a lot more editors and so with um, Dark Crystal we had three editors, three first assistants and I was the only second assistant and so the first assistant of course because you're doing so many episodes um, the first assistant can't do everything and so sometimes they'd give work to me to do or they'd uh, and it would like sort of filter that way and I think on the crown we have 10 editors and, and each editor has a sort of assistant and of course they can't do everything all the episodes and so it comes down to comes down to me and so a second the role of a second assistant really is to work with closely with the first assistant in what the first assistant can't do because obviously as Rob said they've got to manage everything and they're working with the supervisor and everybody to try and uh, manage the cutting room as a second assistant you're not really managing uh, the cutting room but you're sort of uh, sort of working on the cut and making sure that the editor is happy and that you're doing things like that Yeah, I grabbed the wrong trackpad sorry I was just muted there and um, so <laughs> Sam does it would you be able to fit Fill in some of the blanks then for us because you're working as a second on features um, but have worked on other stuff as well. So is there anything you'd like to add to what the guys have discussed? 
your mic is muted there. It's contagious. Oh, we lost Sam. Have we lost Sam? Sorry. Oh, cool. <laughs> Um, so as Lydia was saying, yeah, it's kind of facilitating the requests of, of the first assistant predominantly. Um, I guess the main part of the role, certainly during the shoot, is um, dailies and, and rushes. Um, and getting the media in, talking with the lab, um, working out, you know, how often you're going to what are you going to do dailies every morning or split dailies? Um, getting that from the lab, um, liaising with the script supervisor to get their notes um, and the sound department to get their rushes. And sometimes the lab will, will sync everything up for you, but uh, I've been on shows where they have and I've been on shows where they haven't and we've ended up syncing stuff. So working out with the first assistant how the editor likes to work, how they like their rushes, whether they like master clips, sub clips, um, uh, how many microphones they want in their um, rushes, whether they just want mixed tracks or they want any ISOs. Um, and then processing all of that, syncing those up, um, and basically getting the rushes from the, from the lab and delivering them to the editor so that they can, they can begin their part of the job. Um, Post-production, I think the guys have kind of covered the, the various <coughs> roles. So... Yeah. Um, Do you guys, so the one thing that we haven't talked about is where you're working. Are you generally working in the same building? Or are you generally working in the same room? Well, yeah, that could vary, I suppose. I mean, I've definitely been on jobs where when, when I was a second say, I would be working in with the first assistant. Sometimes that depends on budget of a, of a job when maybe they can only have two rooms and then the editor would be in one room and then first and second and another. I know on Dark Crystal, there was two other first assistants. So we were lucky enough to have a whole floor. Um, and it was really great for communication, you know, and because uh, Mr. Shirley was there and Joe was there and we could all just communicate with each other about all these little issues that were going on. So yeah, I, I suppose it varies, but ideally in the same building. Yeah, and so Lydia, for you on a, on a TV show where you're the one second and you've got three firsts, are you guys sharing an office or? you want in the same building or? Um, yeah, so uh, on Dark Crystal, as Rob said, uh, I, there were two other assistants and I, at, I was sharing a room with the first assistant, which was really helpful with communic, as Rob said, with communication. But um, with the Crown at the moment, we're very lucky that we have a whole floor and we've got our own offices, which is very nice. I've never had that before. I've always had to share. So it's great having your own office. Um, and uh, But we are all on one floor, which is great for communication because we can just go into each other's rooms and say, and ask all the mundane questions of, is this the right file? What are you talking about? And stuff like that. Because filtering uh, through emails is really hard. <laughs> So are, are you guys, like, do you guys, would you in a day sort of start your day with a meeting or are you doing this sort of, this communication you're talking about, is that happening sort of willy-nilly as you bump into each other or is there something more formal at play? Well, I, t I suppose during rushes, everything is pretty laid out day to day in that usually you'd get your rushes at a set time. And so you have a sort of routine as to what's going on. And then, um, so just one thing to mention as well about kind of uh, where people are situated in within a job. I mean, it's super important for all the editorial staff, the picture editorial, to be all together because we're off one ISIS or Unity or a Nexus, or whatever they're called now. And so really, um, we physically have to be a cable length apart and these cables can run quite far. But yeah, that, that sort of restricts somewhat as to how far people can get away. Because, I mean, you can have a remote drive, but it's not ideal. Sure, sure. And we, we, we probably should, we'll get into that maybe later on, talking about that sort of security and um, some of those reasons why we do often all work in the same building, which aren't just about practically being close to each other, but also about security and, and ease of file transfer. So maybe what we'll do now is just do a quick intro into what an assistant sound editor's role is. Um, so Louise, I wonder, could I start with you and maybe you could give us a bit of an idea of the workflow on a feature film? Yeah, so um, basically I think our main job in, as an assistant on a feature is to deal with all the turnover that comes in. So every different version we have to make sure that we're getting everything from the feature assistants 
and distributing everything out to the departments that need it. Um, we also deal a lot with, in turn with that, with recuts and making sure that, you know, we're cutting the picture for the various different departments. So when I say departments, I mean dialogue effects and music if we're working with them. Um, we do a lot of ADR prep and, you know, like queuing for ADR. Um, depending on who you're working with, if you're working with dialogue departments, you'll often do a lot of dialogue conforming. If you're working with effects, then you're often going through rushes and searching for any useful effects. Um, that might be useful for the track lay and bits and pieces like that. Um, and generally just keeping everything organized and backed up um, so that again, like with picture, you, you, know, you, you know where everything is and you can find it and everything is nicely laid out. <laughs> Uh, cool. Well, look, what, what I think we might do is we, there's a bunch of terms and a bunch of ideas that you're all mentioning, like ADR and turnovers, and we'll get into maybe some of the, the nitty gritty of that as we go. But what I might just do is just throw to James. Um, James has worked on obviously features and uh, series, and you also have that added component to the assisting work you've done, James, where you've worked at a facility. So I wonder if you might give us a little bit of a, an introduction to that, please. Yeah, well, um, lots of the components are the same. Um, although every facility is going to do something a bit differently. Um, but where I was working, which was Halo, uh, we, were, we were kind of sound assistants. So it wasn't just assistant sound editor, it was just slightly broader. So we would do everything that Louise uh, has mentioned, um, but because uh, the mix would also be taking place in the same facility often, you would, you would kind of track the show right from the very beginning all the way to, to the end in, in a similar way that you do on a feature, but um, it would kind of involve uh, a bit of mix assisting as well, a bit of mix teching, um, lots of kind of setting up making sure the editorial stage transfers into the mix room um, and then through onto delivery as well. Um, so as a sound assistant uh, on Luther, for example, I was involved in kind of setting up projects and, and, and coordinating media, but also delivering the show at the end um, and chipping in with QCing. So it, it, it kind of, it had a bit it, in that facility environment, it kind of had, um, a lot of overlap with with kind of other elements of of the sound process um, which was yeah which was really great but you know as you kind of expand out into feature I think those those roles kind of maybe get uh, siphoned off slightly more but um yeah. sure so there's, there's maybe a little bit more specialty as in the sound assistant might just work with the with the dialogue crew or might just work with the ADR crew or might just work with the effects or with yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, because I guess it's just, it's all a question of scale, um, right? Uh, especially in terms of whether there even is an assistant. So, so when when you're in when you're in the facility like that, are you potentially then working on several different projects at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, it, it will then kind of come down to the facility coordinators or post producers to sort of manage your workload. Um, uh, with a with a kind of you know a bigger drama you might be sort of um you might be sort of siphoned off and and you'll be you'll be used for that drama sure. and then you'll do bits and bobs uh on, on other stuff too um but even down to sort of your shift pattern changing and and you know the hours you work will will kind of be determined by that but you you will you'll be multitasking a, a, a little more i suppose sure and joe can i come to you now and just ask you you're obviously working in between features and tv and you're a freelancer and so you're coming at it from that point of view i just wonder if you could give us a bit of an intro to what that work is for you yeah i mean louise and james have have covered the kind of general aspect of what it is to be an assistant um and there are a lot of overlaps between working on a film a feature film and a high-end tv drama um but i think like for me, the overall thing, apart from the fact that we're dealing with turnovers, which we'll, go into, which we'll go into, and the fact that we are making sure everything is kind of working and that our sound editors have everything they need to be able to just get on with their creative work. 
um, communication is such a big, big, big part of our job because we're kind of like a, <clears throat> a focal point to lots of different people. So of course we communicate all day, every day with the sound editorial team, um, <clears throat> making sure people know what's happening. Um, you know, that everyone is on board, like that everyone knows what's going on, that if we've received a turnover or we're expecting something. And of course we're always liaising with the picture department and the picture assistants as well. Um, and then towards the end during the mix stage and that process, we're also a kind of focal point for dealing with the, the mix techs at whichever stage we're working in and mixers. And so yeah, communication is definitely the, as well as organization and just being able to be really anal about everything. Um, <clears throat> that's probably like one of the biggest, biggest, parts of the job cool. so I, I think it, it's like I think the thing that all of all of you have in common is that you're doing an awful lot of organizing you're sort of this constant um, growing vast hub of information about the show that's been worked on and you're also essentially the point of contact that anyone else in the crew has about where the project's at. A really simple example for me uh, on the show that myself and Joe worked with was that Joe would have such a brilliant idea of what cut of which reel we were on on the film. And we had a we had this big marker board in her room, big whiteboard, and, and we, we could just keep up to date with what cut of what reel was, was active. And Joe would send a photograph to us of that just so that we all knew what we were up to on a given day. Um, there were times where we might get the same reel turned over, over to us a couple of times in a day on that show. So being able to have someone who just had an eye on that so that we didn't have to was really brilliant. And, and it, you know, it's one tiny aspect of the millions of things you're dealing with every day. So I think like what might be interesting to talk about is what the first day on the job is like for any of you. So I wonder, Lydia, could I throw to you and just ask like, what, what's your first day like? Uh, like what's involved at that point in the process? Uh, I, and, and at what point in the filmmaking process do you begin? Yeah, so um, a lot of people don't know, but for editor, the editors and the editorial team is that we start um, when the shoot starts, well, a little, a little before, so a week before when they're doing test shoots, they're doing camera tests, they're doing costume tests, they're doing uh, makeup tests, that's when we start. And it's our job, we might start on the first day and we sort of meet the team and everything. And then we, it might be our job that they'll, we'll have to send the camera tests and the costume and the makeup tests out to different um, people who uh, we have a sort of system where we send out the shots to everybody and they can feedback so that everyone can see it, all the producers and everything can see it. Um, and so that's sort of what our first job is. To, um, also we use a system called Avid and it's sort of getting your Avid sorted and everything and going through any pot and working out any problems. Um, and then sort of after that, when the shoot starts, um, it's sort of a, it follows a process that we'll get the rushes in the morning from the lab, as Sam said, if there is a lab or not. Um, and we'll process the rushes. And another thing that happens sort of on the first day is the editor will give us a sort of rundown of how they like to receive rushes, because every editor is different. And they like to receive rushes in different ways. And so we'll sort of, during the shoot, we'll make sure it's everything's ready for them and then give it to the editor. The editor will watch it and we'll sort of, and then in the afternoon, that's our morning job is getting all the rushes ready for the editor. And then in the afternoon, we sort of uh, work on little things that the editor may want or, you know, other departments may ask for. And this is sort of how the first day and the first weeks in the shoot goes. <laughs> There's a question that's just come in that might be interesting for you to answer for us, but uh, someone is asking why a TV show might have both first and second assistants, and is that purely just a budget thing? So in your experience, um, you know, what, what is it about a show that suddenly allows for there to be that role of the second assistant alongside the first? Oh, well, no, there are second assistants in, fil there are second assistants in film as well. Um, there's a depend, uh, with budgets and everything like that if it's like a really low budget film then maybe you'll just have one assistant 
but um, with uh, high budget films and high budget, uh, high budget series, they'll um, be a first assistant. And the reason there's so many first assistants on a series is because there are more editors. And um, I mean, I think it's a bit hard for one uh, assistant to have so many editors to deal with. So that's sort of what I think, but maybe uh, Rob and Sam can add to that as well. I, I, that's what I've worked, worked out really. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Is there anything you'd like to offer on that? Uh, no, I, I think that covers it. Uh, I, I haven't worked in TV, but certainly from a film, film perspective, it is uh, generally a, a real sort of low, low budget. It wouldn't have a second assistant. It would just have an editor and an assistant. Um, and I guess that the bigger the budget, the bigger the bigger the crew. Roughly, I mean, not always, but. Um, you start getting uh, maybe two firsts, possibly two seconds, and then uh, trainees and even a trainee and a PA to if, if it's a big enough job. But um, yeah, so I guess it is down to budget. Uh, but sure. Not, um, Rob, can I ask you, you like, because you're our first on the panel, can I ask you, did you, have you worked as a second? And if so, someone is just asking what, how one progresses from second to first. Yeah, I uh, I started as a trainee. Well, actually, I started as a runner, you know, in a, a in a dispatch, and um, and then managed to get myself on a film as a PA, and then um, worked my way through seconding, and then yeah, that is one of those uh, ladder jumps that can be, you know, it's it, because the route's not always set out. But what I did was try to get in with as many editors as I could and other firsts uh, kind of in a sort of network in a social environment as well. And so what the best bet is to do is to try and find a low budget film in which maybe they couldn't afford not to be kind of rude, but I suppose a higher end first as an editor and maybe they could get, have a second that is really good. And the second would want to have take on this extra responsibility and it's kind of best for really good for both parties that and that's what I did um, worked on a low budget film and then kind of um, yeah kind of pro progress from there I suppose okay brilliant and so we move over to sound and Louise maybe I could start with you and just ask you to give us a little bit of information about what your first day on a job might be like yeah so I think probably the first one of the first things you do is you know you'll meet the rest of your sound crew um, and try and get a vibe of how they want their turnover. For example, I know we're going to go into this shortly, but um, sometimes for between the dialogue departments and the effects departments, sometimes they'll want embedded AAFs and sometimes they'll want linked to AAFs. So I think the first thing is to decide how they want to receive their turnover. Um, and then you'll make contact with the picture department and make sure that what the sound team are asking for can be achieved and you know that they can provide you with everything that you need um i guess then it's just you know mostly uh, getting over rushes and and anything that you need depending on when you start on the process the last film i was on we started um quite early in the process so they hadn't actually had like a first like director's cut so it took a little like a, a little while for us to get actual picture in so you know we'd have we'd do a turnover of all the rushes and have a sort out and make sure that workflow and things were working. Whereas normally, I think we start a little bit later once they've done a few versions and they've done the director's cut and they've sort of produced have sort of seen a first part of things, um, then you'll receive a full turnover and your sound team can start with that. So I think it just depends at what point in the process you start as to the actual first day of your job. Sure. And are you are you usually working as an assistant to several sound editors or are you working with one sound editor in particular or how does that work? Well, I mean, in for the jobs that I've done, I've been working with a team. So I've worked with both dialogue and effects. And on Bohemian Rhapsody, I was also working with music. So I was the assistant to all three of those departments. Um, and all three of them have very different ideas of what turnover they want and, you know, talking about you know when we get recuts and stuff if the dialogue department will usually move forward you know with every new turnover but sometimes with effects they want to wait until 
there's a bigger jump and then they'll recap because there's lots of chopping and stuff. So, you know, keeping an eye on all of those things with all these departments gets you know, tricky. <laughs> but yeah, so that's basically, yeah, the first day is just getting process and what everybody wants. Cool. And Joe, have you anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, I guess, um, I think because every, every project is different and like Louise said, um, sound editors want things differently and so each job you might be working with different people and so I think there's there's always a little period at the beginning where you're there's a bit of trial and error between say for example what we what we're being given from the picture department so there might be some technical trial and error in going on because or there's always something every new film or project there's always something that gets thrown in that makes you like scratch your head for a bit to figure it out um, and yeah, so there's, there's that side of it and just also kind of, especially if it's pe with people you haven't worked with before, you kind of have to kind of get a feel of each other and what, obviously what they want, what the sound editors want is the important bit for us to kind of find out. Um, and what, you know, so what... <coughs> Is that like that finding out that you're talking about? Is that a direct conversation or is that a feeling out of situation for a few days or how does that generally work? I think like for me, I'll, I'll, I like to have the conversation because it's kind of, you know, let's just straight away talk about how things are going to go. But then naturally, you know, you'll figure things out even a few weeks or even months into the process, you'll actually realise that maybe it's better if we have something this way or we ask for something else for the, from the picture department if it's not working and, and and that's different every time so yeah definitely an initial conversation um i think with when me and you worked on radioactive it was also probably the first job where you'd had an assistant so we were both a bit like you were kind of asking me what what I was there for, like what to do, because you don't know yourself. I, like I was very grateful to have you there, but I was also kind of wondering how we would work together so that, yeah. you know, we could both figure out the best way for that workflow to work and uh, yeah. to figure out also, I suppose, um, uh, I mean, I guess I was really conscious that I didn't want to be doing things that you sh you would naturally be doing because I didn't yeah. want to be in your way. And I, I think one of the things that's really important um, in this work and in what we're talking about is the relationships everyone has. And so it's really important to establish who is the first point of contact between picture and sound. Um, so yeah, if that person, sorry. No, I was going to say, like kind of following on from that, there'll always be email introductions or you know if you're in the same building obviously you'll go and meet people and see who everyone is and what everyone's roles are so that's kind of definitely that's generally a day one thing so that everyone knows who who's on the team um and also just a really really basic but really important thing is like if it is literally the first day and you've been given the rushes and you're all trying to kind of like collectively decide on a folder structure of all the turnovers for example that's the first thing you'll do just to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that there is kind of you know unity between everybody from a sort of file management perspective as well yeah and I, I think that probably leads us naturally on to talking about turnovers and I think uh, it'd be really interesting maybe to, to to just start actually talking about what's in that list um, and how that works and maybe we start from a sound point of view and then we can talk to through from a picture point of view what that means for you guys and maybe what the other demands on you other than sound are for each turnover so James could I throw to you and ask you maybe just to describe what's involved in a turnover um, and, and what we're looking for and why as a sound department yeah so I guess a, um, a basic level what we want is uh, a picture a video file with the latest cut on that picture we want um, various kind of information burnt in. Um, so like a picture version, uh, a master time code, a source time code, um, maybe a camera roll. Uh, the more information, the better from my experience that you can get in that burn in. So at any given shot, you know, the source time code, what the file name is, what the, you know, the role name is. Um, along with that, you will get um, uh, DMEs or sound guides. So that'll be a dialogue, music and effects, WAV. 
uh, which should sync with the picture. And we'll, I guess we'll talk about sync props and stuff. Yeah. But we 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 want to make sure that the the picture and the the sound is in sync because they'll come separately, and um, then we'll get uh, an AAF, which will be the uh, you know a, a more complicated version of the sound maps. Essentially, it will be what's on the editor's timeline in terms of their dialogue clips, their their music files, their their, their effects, um, and then we'll get some EDLs for picture and sound. Um, and they will describe how all the picture and audio is cutting in each sequence. So uh, I guess those are the components. Um, and uh, I always think it's really useful to get a change list as well. Um, but depending on <laughs> which is, you know, which is to say that if you're, if you're say this is your second turnover, the first one would, you know, no need for a change list. Say this is your second turnover. Um, obviously something, it's got to have changed, otherwise they wouldn't have turned over the the the, the reel or the episode. So a brief um, you know rundown of what's changed, although obviously that's more or less possible depending on where you are in the um, uh, the process. And I think it's probably a bit of an annoyance for picture assistants if a <laughs> if a sound assistant is asking for a, for a, for a, a you know a, a change list, as it were, if there's been three hundred cuts, for example. Sure. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking. So, so in those circumstances where it is a case of 300 cuts, how are you figuring out what those changes are? So this is where the, yeah, this is where the EDLs come in really useful um, uh, because you can take uh, an edit decision list from the first turn, the turnover, for example, and take an edit decision list from the second turnover um, and put that into a piece of software that will compare the differences, uh, essentially. Um, and this is where sort of, you know, uh, uniformity comes in really useful because if, if everything is the same, made in the same way every single time, named the same way every single time, it's super easy for me to be like, there's the old cut, here's the new cut, let's see what's different and then, and then go from there. And everyone will have different ways, I think, of recutting stuff, um, which I think would be interesting to talk about because it changes from department to department, from editor to editor. Sure. Um, some people don't look at edit decision lists sometimes, but um, uh, it, it's a it's a really great. F however, you're going to recut your your sequence uh, from one picture version to the next. It's a really good place to start to see start getting a feel for what may have changed. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's really good. So maybe we'll throw to sound Robert. Maybe as a first, you could talk about um, what's involved in the turnover for you and what's useful from the sound department uh, information wise so that we can make sure that we're working in the way that James has described where we have that uniformity and we have that ease of progressing and figuring out how the cuts are changing. Yeah. Um, the, the super mo mo most important thing is, as we've all said, is uh, labeling and organization. Uh, even for that's sort of for editorial as well in that if you if James were to call me, we've worked together before, and he would say, "Hey, on this version, version X Y, why is this doing this bit?" And I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I'm just going to pull that up, kind of very quickly because it's all all structured in the Avid, so I could just pick it up." Uh, as for turnovers, yeah, <laughs> we sort of touch base with all the soundies to say, "Hey." What, what do you want in your turnover? And then inevitably, like James said, quick time, many different flavors of codec. So we'll sort of not figure out what they want. And then AAF, again, loads of different ways you can do an AAF. So you sort of work through what, what ideally they, they, they're wanting, an EDL, same, same principle. But I suppose, what I would really like to just say about what turnovers and why they're super important is to put it in perspective, uh, each department, sound, music, grade, VFX, no others, are all working separately in their own isolated areas, right? So sure. if you've got an editor chopping up the, the, the cut and then a week later we're mixing a film and the sound boys 
and girls don't have the correct picture, it's not going to sink in the, in the mix, right? And then the music isn't going to play in the right time. And so, and then, then, then all this, the studio execs are like, what's happened? <laughs> and so it's, that's why it's so important to keep all these turnovers in each department, because you, that's what you guys have been saying is that you're filing it really well as well. So that, you know, effectively at the end of the, at the end of the, the whole post-production, you can layer everything, the, the sound, the music, the picture, and it's all going to be in sync real, real nice. Yeah. So that consistency and that sort of whatever that communicate again, we're talking about communication between everyone to some extent. So within the sound department, within the picture department, between the sound department and the picture department, but also between the picture department and VFX, the picture department and score or music, music supervisors. And yeah. unless everyone's like, there is a fork in the road where sound and picture in all their various forms separate, and they really only come fully back together at the end of the process. And if everyone hasn't kept up to date with picture changes in a way that's easy to read or easy to follow, then there's an always a possibility that something will slip and slide and the finished film will not be what it is supposed to be. Um, and that's when panic begins. And often there's not time for that panic. So you need that, that, that communication and I suppose that, that information back and forth is really important. Um, so I wonder, like, in terms of sort of Sam or Lydia, maybe you could talk a little bit on this. If, you, if you're actively doing a turnover for sound, um, what, like, what is, what's useful to you? What, like, what is the one thing as an assistant doing a turnover that's a mystery to you for maybe for what we're looking for from you? Or uh, what information is useful to have that maybe sometimes you don't immediately get from sound and have to go looking for? in that turnover process? Um, I guess, uh, as we've all said, it's communication. So um, sitting down, actually, if you can, going and, and sitting down with, with um, the sound team, as James was saying, and actually talking through, and actually even sitting there, for, if you can, if you've got the time for half an hour and working out why, they do, why it is they need something. Um, I know when James and I were working together, there was the occasional um, workflow kind of thing where it may not have been immediately obvious why James needed that or why I needed it back from him in a particular way. Um, and, but as soon as you kind of sit down and look and, and, and explain how much easier it could make the other person's job, then um, I think that helps, certainly helps um, come up with a, with a uh, a good and efficient um, solution for everyone. Yeah, just to, just to jump in there, it was, you know, assuming that there's time and assuming it's the right, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the picture assistants aren't rushed off their, their heads kind of trying to get something done. The most useful thing for me to be able to do from time to time when something came wrong was just to come and sit down in your room and work through the, the problem with you. Because um, you learn something about how the Avid works too. Um, yeah, I guess the better we then know feeds back job. into yeah, yeah. The better we know each other's craft, <laughs> the, the 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 easier everything's going to be. So those conversations were yeah super useful. Cool. And so when you so Lydia, maybe uh, I'll ask you this. So at the point that your editor decides that they are stopping cutting um, to allow you to do a turnover, what sort of process are you involved in? Like you know, we're talking about the AAF, which is the the sound version of the editor's tracks, but often editors work in a particular way and maybe there is a part of your process that's going into their avid tracks and tidying them up so that they are delivered in a certain way to sound. So what sort of processes do you have to think about as you prepare that turnover? Uh, yeah, so when an editor comes in and says, um, I, I've finished editing, uh, please take it. Always make sure that, always be wary that uh, in five minutes time, they'd be like, stop everything. I have to make a change and you have to stop everything and do it and do it all again. So always be wary that things are constantly changing. And that if someone said, and when they say like, oh, you know, it's all good to take, do start the work, but you might have to restart it in maybe five minutes time. Um, so yeah, but when we get the cut, um, we have to, 
go through the audio um, FX and music tracks and uh, due to the AF and how the sound and music team and everyone wants it uh, we have to separate the tracks and so all the music tracks have to be um, on say say you've got five music tracks they all have all have to be in the avid anyway on five music tracks at the bottom and then you'll have your FX tracks and then you'll have your dialogue tracks. Uh, some, most editors are really neat and tidy and that they keep that way. But of course, when you're constantly editing and constantly changing things, uh, you know, effects go in the dialogue column, music and effects are all mixed up together. And uh, unfortunately, it's our job as the assistants to go through and clean it all up and make sure that everything is in its correct um, section um, and then for the AF we uh, depending on whether they want it embedded or non-embedded and that's through communication again uh, we uh, export it out and we'll usually do an AAF uh, a picture uh, a WAV and an EDL and then that goes out to the different departments of sound music um, any other departments, sorry, my mind's gone black, any other departments that need um, audio, it'll go out to the, those departments. And that's, it's really when any major changes have been done. So if you say one day you're doing a turnover and you send it all out and everything's fine and they're working and the sound team and music team are working o over it, but then later on in the day and the next day, there's been a major change. That means you'll have to do the turnover again because there's been a major change and the sound and music teams are working to an older cut. So it's really vital that the music and sound team have the latest cut so that they're, so that as Rob says, if you get to the, mu to when you get to the mixing stage and everyone's like, that's not what we edited, that's all mixed up and the stuff like that. So it's really important that everyone has the latest cut so that we're all working to the latest cut. Brilliant. So maybe Louise, I could throw to you because you were talking earlier about the different types of AAFs maybe that someone in your crew might want. So we've talked about embedded and unembedded. And so is there a particular type of sound editor or effects or dialogue who might want embedded or unembedded and why would they want that and what's useful about that? So usually in my experience, um, it's normally the dialogue side that want um, a link to AAF, which basically means that you have, you basically get sent over all the MXF media that the AVID generates when they ingest uh, the rushes and any sounds that they bring into their AVID. Um, this way, it sounds like a, a lot of work, but it's not because it means that your AAFs are smaller, your file size is smaller, and you just send across individual files that then link to your AAF. So the reason that dialogue normally like this um, is just basically for that is that you have less uh, duplicate media um, when you're dealing because they have so much media with dialogue you have rushes um, you know ADR so they have so much media so to minimize that you you would do a link to AAF where you just have your MXF media and everything will link back to it normally with effects they prefer to have embedded um, usually it's just, you know, then they get like a nice neat package and everything is going to link and they don't then have to think about it. It just anything that's new there lives inside that file. But for dialogue, because the rushes are the rushes, they're not really going to be adding anything new in unless you've sent them ADR and then it comes back to you. Um, it's, I don't know, there's pros and cons to both. I think link to in my brain makes much more sense because you just get like a big dollop of media at the start of the process which is all your ingested rushes and then you have that and any AAF that comes to you will link to it um, but you know sometimes it's nice for neatness just to have a, a nice little AAF packaged up and sent to you so yeah and so when when, when, <laughs> when those turnovers come in then is is it your job to open those and put them into Pro Tools and then provide them to the editors or how is that working? Yeah, so with the embedded AAFs, normally I would sit and open them. So if you've got multiple effects editors, in order to try and minimize your duplicate media, I would sit and open all those embedded AAFs so that we have one set of media that has been timestamped, and then that gets sent out across between your, your editors. Um, if it's a link to AAF, normally I would sit and open it anyway to make sure that everything is linking. And then if there's any files that are missing, I can go back to picture and let them know that we're missing media. 
um, or if, for example, um, the, there's been an effect that's been left on the dialogue AAF that's a link to, then you can go back and, you know, find that media. If, if they've not done, a, if your assistant editor has not done a cleanup and they, or they've left something by accident, you know, you can go through and find the media. And Joe, maybe we'll talk to you now just about, the, we're, we've been talking about conforming and we've been talking about EDLs. And so mm -hmm. there's a couple of questions on the Q&A that are asking about EDLs and how we like them and what they're used for. And, and I guess maybe we could go a little deeper as well. And so when you get that turnover and you, essentially part of your job then is to actually run those EDLs, run conformalizer or eddy load or whatever, piece of software you might be using on the job and and you know or like how much of the fixed work on those reels or on those those effect sessions or those dialogue sessions are you doing yeah um <clears throat> exactly i mean i uh, i use conformalizer um now like for for conforming or for recutting sorry um <clears throat> i do use eddy load sometimes but i find eddy load is good for conforming dialogue so that you have your kind of you can link and find your all of your original uh you know roles basically um <clears throat> but for recutting conformalizer is definitely your friend like it's um it's great because so yeah as james said before we would be able to so we get a new turnover it's version five the last version we had was version three so we can get version three's edl <clears throat> which is the picture edl um and which displays all of the cuts of picture with the time code original like the, the current time plus the original source time um and then we get version five so we've got so we've got version three version five and conformalizer you chuck these two files in and it will you can compare and basically what it does is it spits out the change list that James mentioned as well. So it shows us all of the different cuts, everything that's changed, whether it's new bits or if things, have, if cuts have been moved, moved around. Um, <clears throat> also conformalizer is brilliant because you can, you can sort of have the quick times in there as well. So you can have version three quick time, version three, version five quick time. So you can just, you have, you can visually see everything and you can move to different cuts or events as conformalizer calls it, um, to be able to check that the EDLs have worked. Sometimes there's there are weird anomalies because it's interesting that that's, <laughs> that's one of the questions that someone's asked. So what do you do when those EDLs do present anomalies? What's the workflow? What's your practice to figure that one out? I mean, sometimes like it's a little bit time consuming, but uh, you can just physically you can go through you can spot through frame by frame, say in conformalizer, you can jump to certain cuts and if something's a bit funky, you can just use in the pictures, so you've got the new and the old, you can frame through to match the pictures and find out where, like how, how, by how much something's changed or, or where something's gone wrong. Um, uh, can I ask a question? The, what, Eddie Load and conformalizer, are they third parties? bits of software and if they are why doesn't pro tools have anything that can do what you want them to want it to do good question Abby. Good question <laughs> um, yeah they, they are third party yeah um and uh yeah pro tools doesn't have anything it doesn't, it doesn't have anything that deals with changes with written no um hmm. it's an amazing question um yeah and as soon as pro tools mm -hmm. do that <laughs> <laughs> something's going out of business but but yeah it, these softwares exist because pro tools don't 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 do that um and they're so, regularly yeah. updated aren't they yes yeah yeah one of the one of the brilliant things about both of those pieces of software is they're small companies and uh, generally and they're both actually weirdly southern hemisphere i think one's australia one's new zealand and mm. they are incredibly responsive so if you like the, we were having an EDL issue on a show I was working on recently and we got in touch with Conformalizer and they sent us a, a new version of the software. Guy just very quickly wrote some code. He said, oh, I can see what the problem is. Sent them the EDLs and he sent us an update that, that allowed us to deal with it. So they're, and, and generally they're people who work doing 
there's they have sound editorial experience if they're not doing it every day they have a background from that so their knowledge of that's amazing and and essentially the software takes control of pro tools and makes the changes for you uh and then you have a lot of fixing to do because it's it's just making changes based on numbers rather than based on sort of how you creatively had pieced your session together I was going to say as well, like it really depends how much of the recutting and fixing you do really depends on who you're working with. Um, you know, there are some people I've worked with where they're quite happy to give you their session for you to recut. Um, you can obviously use Conformalizer or Ready-Load to kind of uh, to slave into Pro Tools and do it. Or uh, a lot of people just recut manually because it's it's basically that it's, it's a safer way really so you have complete control over what you're moving around especially if you've got to the stage where you've also got automation it just makes a lot of sense to do it or to, uh, do it manually but <clears throat> what say for example on uh, on no time to die we would i would basically uh use conformalizer to figure out a change list and then i would recut the guides so picture and audio and then basically pass that over to the sound editors and they would then use those as a guide and recut them recut their own sessions manually and it's just different different teams different people do it differently as well i think one thing just to pipe in um often with dialogue i find it much easier to recut manually because if you have like when they're moving around dialogue it doesn't match the picture it's not sync it's like off screen or voiceover um you're um, software won't be able, it won't realise that that's what's happened and often bits of dialogue can move and get lost basically or if you're dealing with ADR as well, you know, these things can slip and slide all over the place. I know I've had ex experience with that myself, like losing bits and pieces and you think, oh my god. So you have to, you know, go back and put it back together because the software just can't see that kind of detail. So often, like Joe was saying, one thing that's really useful is you can go through and use your software to cut the guides so that you know sort of where the actual picture changes are and then manually go through and check that things are you know in the right place yeah that's really that's that's key isn't it because actually the it'll make the holes based on the numbers but but the actual work is much more nuanced and creative from the point of view of the picture editor and and from ourselves like everything is a little bit more nuanced than because so the only other thing i can think of in terms of edls that maybe is worth discussing is um why might we need a sound EDL? Sound EDL. For... Like a dialogue, a dialogue EDL. Well, like just a, you know, so, you know, generally we're, with Conformalizer, we're using picture only um, as we're going through those sort of changes. But if, if we're in a situation where we maybe need to conform sound roles or we need to, so what, like, what would we be looking for in that situation? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I uh, if I'm I've, I've worked on a few things where I'm assisting the dialogue supervisor or dialogue editors, and so part of that job, as Louise said, is uh, <clears throat> can, when you get you're given a new turnover, say for example a brand new reel, uh, you want to conform all of the dialogue so that you can give a session or a, however many tracks to the dialogue editor, which will have each take and each microphone you know, for that specific take in line. Um, <clears throat> and dialogue or audio EDLs are really useful to be able to do that. And I use them uh, by, you can basically use an eddy load, which is, we sort of talked about before, you can create uh, a conform trap using a dialogue um, EDL. And basically what it is, the difference between it compared to the video EDL, or picture EDL, it still has the same time codes in terms of where it's where they're coming in and out, but <clears throat> it has the information, the kind of source time code of the rushes, basically. So it will be able to you these this this information can help you find um, all of the original sync sound, which is what the dialogue editors are going to use to cut. Like they don't ever cut anything straight from the Avid with MXFs or. So we have to kind of provide the dialogue editors, or if we're editing dialogue, we have to find the original takes, the original tracks to be able to cut with. And then you can sort of find the best microphone, the best sound using those um, 
So that's where I'd use an audio EDL. Can I just jump in there as well? There's often, um, with the dialogue editors that I've worked with, they like to have um, a sync EDL as well, which is slightly different to the audio EDL because the audio EDL is basically what comes out of what the audio tracks are coming out of the Avid. But with the sync EDL, it's literally the original sound that matches exactly the original picture because sometimes they do in the edit, they'll swap out takes of dialogue for a better, a better mat, like a, a different performance or for technical reasons, there's might be like shash and noise under it. So they'll swap it out in the edit. But if you're then going to use that to record ADR because the original audio is so bad, you need to have that original audio so that you can get your original sync. Um, so a lot of editors that I work with often ask for that sync EDL, just so that you have the exact sync of what is coming out of the mouth in that frame of picture cool i have a question about that actually which is how how do you guys make that how, how do the picture assistants easily make the sync edl because you won't necessarily have all that audio stacked up because what we're talking about is i guess the dialogue that the editor has laid up versus the the dialogue that strictly syncs with that shot and and those might be different things yeah so i yeah i guess my question to the picture assistance is how and maybe sound because you were doing that you know on the show that we worked on um, yeah so um in order to create that picture edl we have to flatten um if there are multiple tracks of picture then we we flatten that down so that we have a, a completely flat picture um if there's any uh temp comps that we've done so multiple layers within the shot visually then uh, we just use the, the main background plate so whoever's the main character talking whatever um and then it's basically a case of just matching back and cutting in so so if you're in your timeline you'd go to the first shot you'd match back to the source viewer and then cut the audio in and obviously in a reel you could have four anywhere up to 500 shots so that's very time consuming so, so it uh, is time consuming <laughs> yeah yeah but uh there's a way to get that, which is if you use a macro um, which is basically a way of getting the computers to just automate keystrokes. So what you would do 400 times, you just get the computer to do 400 times. Um, so match back, cut in the audio, match back, cut in the audio, match back, cut in the audio. So you can walk away while that's yeah, happening. Yeah, pretty much. You could probably, well, obviously stay yeah. present and alert all the yeah. time, but <laughs> yeah, they can in be, theory, you, know, you could walk away. In theory. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's obviously not not, not advised. Um, you know, you want to you want to supervise your machine, um, yeah. and whatever you do, don't change application because uh, uh, all all sorts of fun starts happening when you're when you're running a, a macro. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, like when we work together, you know, if there's multiple people speaking in one um, in a shot, then uh, or singing. Um, then you may want to provide several layers of sync, uh, uh, the sync EDL. So we, we would do the main one and then on top of that, um, have like a, a layer two, a layer three, a layer four. So, and then when you stack them all up in Pro Tools, you could see, and sometimes we needed to provide a little bit of information to you for that so that you knew exactly which element in the, the picture is which, um, Interesting dialogue, but uh, yeah, so that's how that's how we do that. It's, it, it it could be very manual, but thankfully there, there is a way of, of speeding it up. Cool. So, um, like I think I, I'm I'm wondering if we might. We're, I'm just looking at the time, and we're slightly getting toward the end of our time before we go into the Q and A. So just there's a couple of we we had talked maybe about Lydia. You have you know one of the things that we have an audience that's sort of all different backgrounds and we have a bunch of university students um, who are listening in. And one of the questions we obviously all get asked, and it's a really hard one to answer, is how you start your career in this business. And when we had our little prelim chat, we were talking about the role of a trainee. And I wonder if you would just give us a little bit of an overview of how you found your way into the job that you now find yourself in, what your path was. Yeah. Um, so before I was a trainee, I started off as a PA. Um, I was a post-production PA and then I was a runner and then became, and then a trainee. 
Um, the role of a trainee is a, a brilliant, is a really brilliant way to meet people and also find out the AVID because I went into being a trainee knowing absolutely nothing about AVID because my university course didn't teach it. And so I knew nothing about the system and it looked absolutely terrifying, especially when you see people who just like typing and doing things and you're just like, how the hell are you doing that? Um, so uh, the role of a trainee, I was lucky enough to have my own AVID and it's the best if you it's just as, ask as many questions as possible because you, I, everyone does things wrong, I still do things wrong but you ask and that's how you learn is like when the second assistant is not too busy and they're not doing anything because they like so how did you do that thing before and so keep on asking questions uh, meet meet the whole team meet the, if you can meet the get to know the second assistant get to know the first assistant get to know the editor and what they're doing and everything like that and that's great um, a trainee as well sometimes the, depending on how as we've already mentioned the budget of the production um, sometimes they'll have a runner and a PA but sometimes they won't so as a trainee I had to get lunches and um, drinks um, which is fine it's just the something that you're going that you're going to have to do but in that uh, if you just allow that but pro tip if you get uh, if you get a load of like stamps on your card and you get the free you get to keep the free drink so you know it's uh, the silver linings um, and then if uh, and then just really work on the avid sometimes you'll be asked to do fun things like they'll give you like a, a little bit of a scene and you can add some sound effects and that's really fun and so just try and get as much out of it as you can um the so on Bohemian Rhapsody I was sort of a third assistant slash trainee because I'd already been a trainee before and as I said it's on big productions that you have like third assistant second assistant first assistant and the I say the role of train uh Third, third assistant to second assistant is quite it's not as big a leap as I'd say as second assistant to first assistant I think it's quite a big leap but I I would say that being a trainee really helped me be a second assistant and so if you do have the opportunity to be a trainee do it because it's fantastic it's a really good way of meeting the team working out the politics of the team and who does what and also get to know the system as well if you're not already good on it <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's really interesting. I, I think when we were talking before, uh, we were talking about like politics and communication. We were talking about sort of when you start in this uh, business and you start in a job like this, there's a certain amount of figuring out who you should be talking to and how you should talk to them. And, and I think Sam and James, when we talked before the call, we were talking a little bit about that. And I wonder if either of you would like to sort of give a sense of how you maybe read those politics on a job and what's involved and sort of how job to job, maybe your ability to do that uh, becomes more and more honed. But it's it, it just interesting to sort of maybe discuss how and when you know your place, I suppose, on a production. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, a couple of the jobs I, I have done i i actually joined you know maybe a couple of months into the sound team working so that's especially uh important to kind of work out the vibe um and uh there's actually kind of almost nothing to do with post-production about that skill it's just um i think it's just being able to sense when uh when you have something useful to say and if it's your place to say it in a way it's that kind of makes it sound like a censored environment and it's really not like that but but it's um it's i guess especially coming as in in as a, an assistant you um there'll be areas where you have an expertise that's really helpful to your team and there'll be areas where yours isn't the main expertise and and you're kind of um uh you you have something to learn so i guess in, in that respect it's it's working out when to um Kind of pipe in with your bit but i guess at a very basic level if you're working on um uh, you're lucky enough to work in the same building as a picture as the picture assistants and you walk into the room and they've got one editor asking for this they have they're chatting to the vfx department um and then you're just asking about something quite small which is important but in in the wider scheme of things maybe not as important as the crisis that's happening in front of them it's kind of working out when to slowly back out or when to um 
because one thing I find fascinating about picture assistants is that they're just dealing with so many fronts that, and we are too as sound assistants, but I don't think to quite the same extent. Um, so uh, it's kind of, I, I would say that's the most important thing I've had to work out is to when you can request something and when you can't and when to be patient and, and yeah. allow the picture assistants to do the million things they have to do. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that's a really interesting point as well. Maybe, Robert, I could ask you about that. So we've been talking a lot about turnovers and we've been talking about the fact that you might have to do several different types of turnovers just to sound. But at the point where it has been decided that pictures should be turned over, who else are you providing? And like, do you, are you, like, does the post supervisor say to you, I want you to provide VFX first? then sound, then music, or is there a hierarchy, or how is that figured out? Mm. Yeah, I suppose that's completely dependent on what, what job it is and what deadlines are approaching, as in mixing coming up, or is uh, of the, the orchestra going to be recording some score tomorrow, and the music guy, music person needs their turnover sharpish. Um, so it's just assessing, I think that's really what yeah, part of the job would be kind of like assessing deadlines and kind of prioritizing them uh, in a way that's going to keep everyone ticking over, but also making sure that someone's got something when they really do need it. Oh, but kind of as for um, when that happens, uh, again, that's, you, you could be on a job that is, I've been on shows for like a year and a half, and then we just, it's this deadlines are getting pushed and pushed uh, for whatever reason it might be. And then we just say, okay, we're just going to do your biweekly turnover. And then on other shows, it's very rigid in that um, there's a set director's cut on this date. Then they're going to do the producer's cut a week later when you send you that version. And then there's some last notes from the studio and we're going to send you that version. And, um, that's quite nice when it's all very rigid and structured like that, but sometimes it can get a little sort of hairy in that there's last minute changes and then it's just like, okay, emergency turnover. <laughs> That's like half your day. Let's do it. Yeah. So it's just the, I guess like one of the main takeaways that I have from a conversation like this is the fact that you guys are all like no two days in your job are essentially the same. And what becomes a priority at any moment in any day is constantly changing and i suppose you're constantly having to try to make decisions about what's the most important demand that's currently in front of you and how best you can deal with that so that the other people in your crew can get on with whatever they need to get on with and i i think that's a very interesting um a dynamic job to have to do and i know from my experience having a, a really great picture assistant or picture assistants on a job or and then also having a really great first assistant sound editor on a job like Joe makes all of the other work uh, that we're we're trying to get through and deal with so much easier so it's a you know it, it takes a particular mind I think to be able to do that and uh, so it, it's really interesting to get this insight and I think given the time we're, we're like at a quarter to nine now. So we might go into do looking at some of these, uh, the questions from the audience. So I'm going to just pull up that window and just maybe, maybe as I, I, as I call them out, anyone who feels like they want to answer one, let's jump in and let's be as, uh, as kind of random about this as, as makes sense. And um, the first question on the list is an interesting one. It, it, it says, uh, as a picture editor, uh, I'd like to ask how, uh, what I can do or what we can do to make your jobs easier. So I think that's an interesting one, particularly for the assistant picture editors. What, you know, what can your picture editors be doing for you on a job day to day that makes it easy for you or easier? Uh, well, you, what, what is really super handy is organization in the cut bin um, and up versioning when new edits happen and then labeling what's happened. So I was on, on, um, on Rogue One, every time somebody went into the reel, because the film split into reels, however many it might be, 
whatever was done to the sequence, the, the master sequence, which was green, you would duplicate it, date it, and say, cut in five shots. And so there's, there's just, it could be hundreds, but it's really handy when someone says, okay, let's turn over the show. We're going to do version X, Y, P. And then everybody is on the same wavelength and it will know what's going on. So I suppose that's really handy. Sometimes people like to just work in one sequence the whole time. It can get a little funky. That's all I'll say about that. Do your sound, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I guess it's just uh, communication, um, sharing as much information with us as possible when when the moment comes and, and a turnover is asked for, just um, as much information, if, even if it's just, uh, yeah, the, the cuts were around this scene or between these scenes or, um, you know, you don't need to know specifics don't you, or, but, uh, necessarily, but um, just, just kind of knowing where we're looking for changes or knowing what it is that we should be telling the other departments, any information that we can get, you know, is best from, uh, best from source to, to then pass on to sound music and, and whoever else needs it. Cool. So the, this one I think could be for either picture or sound. Um, and it's an interesting question because I don't know that it's necessarily true, but I think it's an interesting one for any of you or for each of you. Uh, so just as I assume your intention is to become full blown editors, how do you maintain your creative interest when dealing with what is clearly a lot of administration? Do you have side projects that you're working on? So I think it's interesting, maybe, well, Joe, it'd be interesting to ask you because obviously you're an effects editor as well as an assistant sound editor. So, you know, ultimately, is that what you, where you want to go with the work? Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. It's kind of in, on one hand, you know, there are times where, you know, you've been working on a project for months and you're, you're not really doing anything creative um, as an assistant. And you just have to kind of remember that there are going to be those opportunities and actually to be an assistant and to, to have this experience it only stands you in good stead when you are then actually editing. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in terms of having things on the side, it really depends on like time and energy. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of will like, yeah, on Radioactive, I was cutting sound effects as well. And that was great because from the minute go, as well as doing all the assistant work, I was also like cutting temp foley and, um, atmospheres and different things so it's kind of uh, it's that helps the balance definitely um, but on the other hand like I do love assisting it's like a really satisfying job when you are kind of making everything work really well and knowing that everyone else can do their jobs creatively and then when, when there are times where you <clears throat> where I have felt like I am part of the creative collaboration it's great and it just kind of reminds you what you're kind of aiming for um, yeah yeah and I think I mean I think the, the point that I'd really like to make is that it is very possible for someone to be a career assistant because that is an incredibly vital specialized uh, brilliant role that someone can have on a film and it's absolutely essential so that is an aspect of it and um, not all assistants want to become editors they are you know, and most editor, like pretty much any editor can't work without a good assistant. And so it's an absolutely essential cog in the machine of filmmaking. And I hope as we've discussed tonight that everything that you guys are doing is actually making the work possible for everyone else and making the film better and allowing it actually get finished. So I think it's really important to underscore that. But I wonder maybe like, Lydia, Lydia, Sam, Robert, how, how about you guys? Do you have, a, you know, is assisting something that you want to stay doing as a career or do you also film at it or is it something that you'd like to do at some point? Uh, well, um, one thing I would say about the create, well, so yes, there's a lot of administrative boring work. There's no doubt about that. But what I would say is it, it's really important to do that so that there's the time to not have to like fix those issues with versioning 
And then when you get the chance, when the editor comes in and says, oh, can you just work on this scene or whatever, or assemble this scene? If you want to do that, you, you don't have the backlog of uh, workflow to do, and you can just jump right on that. But then another thing um, about that sort of cr creative side is that, yeah, I, I would obviously, I would like to become an editor. Uh, and you've got to be a little bit tactful about when you can be creative and uh, have a good relationship with somebody because let's say if you were making dinner for somebody and then I just came in and was like, Hey, just put more salt in there <laughs> and like sort of completely altered everything. <laughs> I don't know. It can be quite rude. And so you've got to be able to judge um, if, you're asked to assemble something and you you give it and then they like it it could then you in, could inherit that scene and any notes on that scene you could do and so yeah it's a, it's it's a little bit like how to get into the industry how to become a second how to become a first unfortunately there's no clear sort of definition as to how but there's kind of like sort of ways and means of kind of navigating your career to try and get to that where you want to be yeah. hopefully yeah, and I think what's really important there is what, you, what you're saying is that it, it, it is a very creative role and it's really important to, 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 like, the fact that you get to cut scenes or the fact that you're going to get to work with material is creative in and of itself, but actually the problem solving, the management and all of the work that you guys do every day has to, it involves a very creative mind because you have to think on your feet all of the time and you're essentially having to figure out things that have never been done before and, and how they'll be implemented um, so i think it, it is a really creative role as well for lots of reasons and i think that's really important and can't be sort of overstated um, so there's a question here which uh, is uh i am a factual assistant editor and i really want to do film or high-end tv drama how would i get into that and i just wonder has anyone on the panel made that transition from more factual work into into drama and features i guess not not as a not as a picture assistant but i have as a as a sound assistant and i and i guess it will work in a fairly similar way i mean i'll keep my answer brief because i know i'm not a picture assistant here but but um i went from working in a post house um working on factual tv and and tv drama to then uh fe features and and um sort of drama where there's a, a freelance crew and um uh it, it was really a question of um being able to meet uh meet the people who will give you those jobs so in in, in the sound case it's the uh, the supervising sound editor or, or sometimes a post coordinator um or even editors but i guess it's it's a case of um trying to meet those people, have a conversation with them, um, send them an email once in a while asking, you know, what they're up to, do they have any work, etc. You know, it's, I guess it, it's the same with the picture assistant world. It's knowing a first, it's knowing a second, it's knowing a picture editor. Um, so as long as you can, and, and you can start to know those people even from within the, the world that you work in, which might be a post house, you can start to build up a picture of, um, who those people are i mean i did it by just going on imdb and finding all my all my favorite sound designers and or supervising editors and then i made that list and then i made a list of all the people i knew and then i tried to work out who might know each other yeah, yeah. so so it, it really does come down to knowing someone who can give you that job but which sounds daunting but um I think there's that brilliant thing where, you know, we all talk about the idea of, 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 you know, being in the right place at the right time and getting that break or whatever it might be. But there is a huge amount of that exactly as you've described, where it's sort of trying to figure out how to put yourself in the right place for that opportunity to present itself and what you've described there in terms of that sort of that research you're doing, but also the conversations you're having and the people you're getting to know is hugely important to that. And I think it's, um, it's hugely valuable and and also it's just really great as a human being to meet a bunch of other human beings who are interested in some of the things you're interested in and to ask them about those and have conversations about them and those conversations often lead to work and shouldn't be underestimated i don't think and you're 
your own passion, like the idea of starting out as a PA or starting out as a trainee and working your way up into a second assistant role or first assistant role. That, that doesn't happen because you're, just because you're this technically minded individual. It happens because you're sort of hanging out with people and you're talking to people and they like the feeling that you put in the room when they work with you, I think. And I, I think that that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, so someone is just asking, uh, but sorry, well, sorry, I was just going to quickly like say that, um, <clears throat> and I said it on the Dark Crystal panel as well, but like letting people know what you want to do as well is such an important point because people aren't necessarily going to ask. Mm. Um, I mean, even from if you're starting out, say, as a runner, which I did as well, I, I also worked at Halo as a runner and then a mixed tech. And um, <clears throat> like from from the minute go, it was it was clear to me that like I have to kind of put myself out there and say oh this is what I want to do what do you do or talk to people and try and figure things out because then they you know if and when an opportunity arises then your name might be in their head yeah absolutely and so there's a, another question here that might be interesting to follow on from that so do, you, so do you think here in the UK working as you guys do that it's important to specialize as in do you need to specialize in film versus TV or do you need to specialize like in factual or like how open is the sort of, um, is the possibility of work in several fields or are you better off to be a film assistant as opposed to a TV assistant? Will you get pigeonholed, I suppose, is the question. Can I just say on that front, um, I think that also, yeah, you can definitely spread out and do what, do all all the different genres because fundamentally, it's still the same kind of project, editing, turning over, conforming that sort of thing. Obviously, with um, factual, you're kind of getting into the realms of archive and that sort of stuff. But one thing, uh, so something that I had to think with my career was um, after doing sort of the higher end shows, which are quite presti prestigious, I suppose, it can lead to maybe pigeonhole pigeonholing your role in that particular film. So for example, being a visual effects assistant editor, you know, I'm, I'm only doing say 15 tasks on this particular film. And I was kind of just thinking, well, I would quite like to be doing everything, whatever. So I kind of, try to navigate into lower end shows where actually uh, op opportunities come a little bit easier than if you were working on say the new Batman when it's so sort of um, it's a, you know you're not going to get <laughs> you're not going to get to cut any scenes on that film I would imagine but you know on say Dark Crystal it's whilst it is still quite large budget it was so busy that we all had to chip in and I got to do some editing and it was great. Whereas, you know, on other shows probably wouldn't have been able to do that. That's a really important point actually. And, and Louise, has that been your experience similarly with sound? Oh uh, yeah. I think that, you know, I, I mean, I like Joe, you know, or like all of us probably, we all do, you know, bits and pieces outside of, you know, our assisting jobs where we get the chance to be more creative and do like uh, more of what we want to do you know like and I bounce around from documentary and you know like fiction shorts and features and whatever all low budget stuff um but in terms of getting pigeonholed I think that sometimes I know a lot of advice that's been given to me in the past is that I don't think you necessarily have to choose uh, like a genre of film that you want to work in so you don't necessarily have to choose to do documentary all the time or fiction all the time but I think from a sound point of view what's quite useful is to know whether you want to be say a dialogue editor or an effects editor of course most of us can do both to a certain degree but I think that it's important when people look at your credits and stuff for people to know what kind of avenue you then want to go down in terms of the sound, I think that's where the the divide goes rather than it being, you know, like I say, features or fiction or documentary or whatever. Um, yeah. Can I just ask you one follow up? There's another question here. It's just wondering, do you send assistance? Do you have to have your own rig? 
uh, yes, in my experience, yes. You know, I have, um, so my first job was on Bohemian Rhapsody. So on that role, that job that I did, um, it, it was uh, basically they, they said to me not to bring too much kit. So they didn't want me to bring all my speakers and stuff because basically they weren't gonna, they didn't want to pay for the hire of my kit. Um, so all I brought with me was my laptop and my headphones and, you know, Pro Tools. Um, whereas on the last job that I did, I bought my whole setup and, you know, they, they paid for me to have that and, and it was great. So I think it just depends on the budget of the film and, you know, what's going on. But I think definitely Pro Tools, laptop, headphones are like the bare minimum um, of what you need, you know. But you pick stuff up as you go along, like with each job, you can then treat yourself to something new like if you haven't got eddy load then go out and get eddy load or conformalizer or whichever one you want to do you know get the trial periods of plugins or whatever and see which ones you want to work with and see which ones you don't but it's not like i know a lot of um picture editors they have they go to like high is it high works or whatever and they hire they the productions hire their kit for them it doesn't work like that for us we have to kind of take our own stuff yeah cool um yeah. So can I just, I'm going to do a quick, there's, I have a bunch of quite nerdy um, picture questions and I, these, we could maybe just do a quick fire around of these. So uh, one of them for picture assistance is if you're sending cuts out to producers or directors, uh, do you put a LUT, L-U-T, uh, or send it on grade at flat? So they're just wondering if you've got to do anything grade wise. Um, so generally we'd get the rushes from either the DIT, the digital Im imaging technician on set or the lab, depending which either or, um, with, with a basic daily grade, um, baked in so that they look good in the avid. So generally, or in my experience, at least, uh, what we see in the avid is pretty much what we send to, to, um, anyone really, whether it's producers, directors, um, uh, no extra lot added it's just played out and then uh uploaded to pics cool and that that kind of answers the, the question after that was which which was wondering if the editors are working with some sort of temp grade on the picture which you've just answered because that's coming from the dit um okay joe there's a question specifically for you uh it's just wondering when you're using recutting software for conforms um, how do you deal with automation that's gotten messed around in that process? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the basic process is, say we've got a recutting a reel um, in your Pro Tools session, the existing reel and track lay and everything that you have would just cut and move up the timeline. Um, <clears throat> and then would yeah kind of basically do a cut and paste job manually using sort of going back and moving it around where it needs to go to be back in sync and yeah there's always an inevitably wonky automation and it is just a case of fixing it really and it's the same with the cuts um yeah it's just it's 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 a bit of a pain in the arse, but you know <laughs> it has to be done so <laughs> Just one of the many, uh, one of the many painful parts of the, the process. I find, for what it's worth, conformalizer uh, is kinder to automation than eddy load, particularly for mixed yeah. forms. But that's just me. Um, so some, someone's just asked an interesting question. That's uh, basically, um, do any of you have an agent, and 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 if so, or if not, how where how and where does the work come from? So I'm kind of happy for anyone to answer that. Shall I direct it at someone? I don't have an agent. Me neither. Um, but I think that, again, like we've just been reiterating over and over again, is like talking to people and getting your network of people, uh, people, you know, people who know you and know your work and whatever, and jobs will come from just talking to people and, you know, going to events like this, social events, and just getting your name out there as much as, much as you can. Um, and inevitably someone will come and knock on your door at some point. Cool. Anyone else want to jump in on that from the picture side? Uh, well, sorry, Liz, uh, go ahead. No, no, uh, no, I just want to say from a picture point of view, uh, we don't, uh, assistants don't really have agents. Uh, first, uh, first and second assistants and trainees, we don't have agents. Uh, when you get to an editor, that's when you might choose to have an agent. 
Um, for me, in my experience, the second is this It's really about who, about making, as has already been said, communication, making contacts, and then as you meet people, they'll say, they'll, they might say, oh, I'm going on, a first assistant might say, I'm going on to this production, do you want to come and work with me on it? And you go, yes. Or you might say no, depending whether you got on with that person or not. Um, or um, you might, or you, what's great is that it's quite, it's, what's great about um, editing and working in this industry that everyone uh, that I've experienced me is very friendly and they're like oh do you want to I'm going to this event do you want to come with me and then if you decide to come everyone's really friendly and what's great is that sort of everyone knows everyone and so it's sort of like a little community that you go into and everyone helps each other and so no agents but if you get out there and you go to these events and you meet new people um, and you know you send them an email and you send them your CV chances are that you'll end up in the cutting room at some point cool. sorry Rob <laughs> Yeah. I was just going to quickly say as well that it is it is an nepotistic industry it you know it is you know a fact that generally if you know people that's how you're going to get onto things which is obviously daunting from a perspective of like if you're how how, how the hell do you get in um <clears throat> but all of these things we've said like it is that's how we've all done it and um it is it is possible and you can do it and I think like especially I don't know about the picture the side of things but from the sound perspective like starting as a runner somewhere in a facility is a great starting place because you learn so much and people are generally very like generous with their knowledge and people want to help everyone and most people have started as a runner or as an assistant so there's a kind of like compassion that people generally have so it is a bit scary but it is you know we've all done it you know so yeah i agree about running and also getting into a machine room if the opportunity arises is uh, worth its weight in gold because you really are there's so many different shows that go through a machine room you're learning all these different workflows because after i did um i did two films as a second and i had really quite niche knowledge actually and then i um I couldn't find some work for a little bit and eventually got a job in a machine room. And it really just like opened my eyes to kind of all this different side of the avid. Um, so I'd recommend that if you can. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, that like in, in terms of this that we're talking about as well is that the, you don't to, to do any of the jobs that any of us do mean that you're constantly learning and constantly developing your skills. So and, and by working with each other and working with a, a group of people, you can see how knowledgeable a group of people like this is. And there's so much information to be, be shared around between us that when you hit that point on a job where you don't know the, the answer to the question, there is probably someone in the room next door or an email away on the production or from a previous production you've worked on who's going to be able to give you that bit of information or help you troubleshoot. It. And I think that's really important. Um, there's a question for the picture assistants, which is, uh, if you get to cut a scene or to do an episode recap, say for, for a series, uh, there, this person is wondering if it's something that you're then allowed to include in your own showreel. Presumably you don't have ownership on something like that. Well, um, all I can say for, uh, just from my, what, I, what I've done in, my, in the past, um, any scene that I <clears throat> did on Dark Crystal that um, I basically asked Netflix if I could take it and they had this portal where I could download it and then I asked the editor if I could use it in my showreel or just like little snippets I would send to people. But I think that, yeah, it might be a case of kind of just flagging maybe to... Um, the post supervisor or maybe the editor or not it's if, if you worked on it you, and it's released who's to say that you can't put it on your showreel i don't I, I don't know the answer to that one tomorrow so there's probably two different ways of doing that can I, rob can i ask you one other question which is specific to someone here but also something we haven't really covered so you've obviously worked as a vfx editor so uh like what what is that role what are you doing as a vfx editor well, VFX editing is effectively tracking and managing every single VFX shot in the show, labeling it, sending the, the correct length of that shot to the uh, VFX vendor, 
to then do the work on it. And then they, then you get it back and you cut it in to the sequence and then the editor sees it and they say, oh, we like it this way. Um, so effectively the job is manage just sort of whenever the cut's changing, as you can imagine, maybe a shot you've already turned over has extended. You then have to send that. So you've got to be on top of all these shots, um, making sure that they're, the vendor's working to the right length effectively. Sure. And the, then someone is wondering what shots or sequences on Rogue One that you did you work on? And I'm assuming you had a hand in sort of managing all of that work. I think I probably turned, well, we call it turned over. And Sam was also on Rogue One too, um, working with ILM. Um, I turned over about 4 million shots when, <laughs> cause it was, the film went through quite a lot of iterations, but anyway. Uh, so I, one thing that was quite cool about that show was that we got to have a look at some original footage of uh, one of the guys in the X-Wing. And cause they wanted to use that in the final sort of sequence, this final showdown. So I got to sort of scrub, scrub through it all and see how it was all shot back in the day. And then, I mean, I didn't work on it as in like I didn't edit or anything, but I sort of was across the whole show VFX wise, kind of tracking and managing that stuff with Mikey Chung. Cool. Um, so there's a, there's a question here that that's another interesting one for picture people uh, and, and but it relates to sound. So the person is asking if you find it easier on a job when there is an assistant sound editor. And the reason they're asking is because often, that's a line item that disappears in the sound department quite quickly um, at a budgeting stage. So is the workflow generally more manageable and better when there is a, a good first assistant sound editor? From um, well, a picture point of view, sorry. Uh, no, so, no. Sam, go ahead. Rob, you go. I mean, I would probably say, I'm being honest here, we send our turnovers, it gets disappeared into sound land and we don't really hear back except for when you get, give us stuff back, you know, so it doesn't really make a difference to us. <laughs> well, Sam, it might be interesting to ask you about that because it sounds like yourself and James had to have quite a close relationship on Dark Crystal, right? Uh, on Cats, but, um, but before James came on board, we were turning over directly to the, to the two supervisors. Um, I don't think it really made a difference from our point of view. It was just, again, they were our point of contact and, and just making sure that, um, I, I guess the, the main difference would just be that we'll try and pick up any slack, um, anything that makes it easier for them to conform because they haven't got an assistant to help them. Um, I mean, we always try and make it as easy for the department as possible, but anything, any extra, you know, kind of, um, uh, workload that we can take off them to make it quicker for them to start actually doing the editing rather than conforming or ingesting. Um, that's the only real difference. Whereas if there is an assistant sound editor, then they can obviously pick up a lot of that slack. Cool. And also just to follow on from like our perspective as well, like to especially when when there's like a really intense period and there are lots of turnovers and we're getting ready for mixing and loads of stuff's happening <clears throat> to have a kind of an, an allegiance with the picture assistants is really really great because it means that we can all uh you know we can ring each other and text each other and be in constant communications that's not always about you know emails to five million people and we can kind of in effect have each other's backs but as a result of that, we've got the backs of all of the sound editors and no doubt for those guys, for the picture editors as well. <clears throat> so, yeah. And we can go to the pub at the end of a tough day yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so can I, can I just ask you, do you like, and this is for, for, for both sides, um, what do you think the biggest misconception about your job is and, and you know, like, and what are the sort of most common sort of maybe misunderstandings between picture and sound that hopefully a conversation like this irons out for us? Like the biggest misconception about my job is, you know, when, when I, when someone often likes something that I've worked on, they'll, they'll ask me if I pick the music. <laughs> 
you know, and, and it'll be that sort of, oh, you were involved with sound, so that's music. So I just wonder, is there something within the role of, a, of, a, of an assistant sound editor or of, of an assistant picture editor that's just sort of goes, you know, is misunderstood or, and then I suppose it's probably worth talking about any sort of miscommunications that can happen between picture and sound that are easy to clear up if we have a conversation like this. I think that somebody who maybe wasn't in the industry and was looking from the outside in tend to not appreciate that everything you're seeing and hearing was meticulously created by like 50 or so people on some shows, you know? Also, I think that like probably most people don't know that our jobs exist full stop, whether you're an assistant or an editor. I mean, especially in sound. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people just, it's just not, you know, not something a lot of people know about. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just the fact that we do have a job and we exist. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you on the, on the music uh, thing, Steve. I so often say when I work in sound and they'll be like, oh, you absolutely love the music. And it's like, Go and tell that person. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. So, so it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, the, it's the difference between the soundtrack and, and, and the, the, the original score and the, and the effects and the dialogue and the... Um, but I think I, I, I would just say on the on, on um, the other side of that is that I every picture assistant I've met so far has understood exactly what I'm doing, um, and right. and uh, which makes it super easy when you have an issue and they, they'll know why you're you know I, it, that in general that's why people get to where they get to I think maybe because they especially as a picture assistant I guess you need to know exactly what you're doing for the sound assistant and why so every, every one I've met so far is there, there have been almost no misconceptions about what I'm doing so right you know in a, in the in the film world yeah I, I wouldn't say I've come across many yeah that's good to hear so there's a there's an interesting question that just is uh I'll throw this to Louise what's your favorite thing about your job what do you love about it well, I'm quite a social person. And so when you're an assistant, you know, you're dealing with, you're spending time with everybody every day. Um, if you're, you know, like if you're working in a facility, you're always in contact with people. Um, so I love that about my job. Um, I also find it quite fascinating just in the assistant role to watch from a distance, but to watch your other editors and what they do and how their process is and, you know, you can learn a lot from just watching people um, to then take away and, you know, to use, to hone your own skills. Um, so, yeah, I love people and I love learning new things. So that's why I love my job. <laughs> cool. That kind of sums it up, I think. Um, there's another question here that just is wondering if anyone on the panel has either moved from sound into picture or picture into sound. Um, I don't know if that's been the case for anyone. I... Uh... When I was working at Halo, a post-production company in in Soho, um, one of the ways they like people to move up through the company, and I think this was after Joe's time, I think, but um, if you wanted to get into any part of the company, whether that be um, grade, online, sound, you would have to go through um, uh, the machine room or the tech tech department. So. Um, I have to say at the time, I felt uh, a little begrudgingly about this because, you know, here was me turning up as a runner and I wanted to be a sound editor. And, you know, no, you have to be a picture assistant. So, you know, I had to go through a machine room and I was there for a year and a half, but um, uh, it was it, it was amazing. It was it was genuinely, I think I'm better at what I do as a result. I, I can have, I can communicate better with, with uh, picture assistants as a result. Um, you know, I'm not cutting anything. I'm not. I'm not ingesting anything anymore. I'm not using Avid, but um, uh, I got that grounding in a machine room, which I think was um, interesting. Just even if you're interested in the film process generally. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I begrudgingly did it, but then in retrospect, it was it was great. I think just jumping in on that. I mean, I. I went to film school and as part of the process there you we spent a week basically with the avid and just trying to learn 
obviously not in as much detail as what editors do, but, you know, basically trying to learn the software, how it works and how editors will get turnover and stuff out of the Avid in preparation for, you know, coming to sound. So I think it's, it is really useful, not that I've ever been a picture assistant, but to know the flip side as from a sound perspective so that you understand how, what the editors are doing to get the stuff that you need and vice versa probably it's quite useful for editors to understand how Pro Tools works even just a little bit so they can understand how you know those processes work yeah absolutely um i think we're, we're sort of getting near the end but uh, there was one thing that we all talked about when we were doing our little bit of planning for this and i think it was lydia who originally brought it up which was the idea of being able to write a good email and I think you had a good story as well about how you ended up in that first trainee position, didn't you, from sending an email? Is that right? Yes, yeah. So um, something that I've learned throughout the job is um, writing a good email. And those uh, that two things. First of all, when you're in the job and you write an email, my if I look back on my old emails, I used to put all just put all the information, slap bang, like just long emails reams and reams and reams but uh through doing the job i've learned that like you just put the facts and everything else follows and it's when i used to send things to the sound editor i used to put like this like long email this life story this narrative but actually all they want is name the file what's in the file and what they can and what you want to do with it and that's it they don't want to hear like what's been going on and stuff like that um <laughs> let's remember we used to call it less flowers yeah, less flowers. I was very much like, how are you? How's everything? Um, so yeah, so that's <laughs> that. Just put the backs and then maybe in, as we said, in the pub afterwards, you can talk about everything else. Um, but, and then there's the email, the initial email of um, sending it to people who maybe you've met, a, you've, maybe you've, uh, so we've given each other email addresses at this event and you're a bit scared about what to email them because they said, you know, send me your CV. So um, it's best if you just make sure you have the CV, you have your CV and you put it in, you go, hi, so and so, because sometimes you can be, it's like you're taught in school, well, I was taught in school anyway, that you have to put like, you know, dear Mr. Like Mr. Rogers or something like that, when actually you can just put, we're quite informal, you can just put hi, their first name, you won't take offence from it and then you put um I met you maybe if you met them you say I met them met you at this um I met you at this event and you said to see send you my CV I'm just sending you my CV um if you know of any productions or um any roles opening up for a trainee or a runner please um pass it on or something like that and then you can just put like you don't have to put regards or anything you can put like thanks and then your name and then I personally I always look at the CVs that I get and I do pass them on because uh to get a job in the cutting room you have to go through a post supervisor and so um, sending your CV to a post supervisor is really important because they're sort of the manager of the team and they do a lot of the hiring or a first assistant and you know we, we get asked all the time like oh do you have any CVs um, of people I'm looking for um, and as as I said before being a trainee is great and you know you might have loads and loads of avid knowledge from your university course unfortunately it's that doesn't transpire into experience in the cutting room and experience is always more important so you might have all this knowledge which is fantastic probably no more than me but if you don't have experience in the cutting room it can it, it's all a bit tricky so what i'm saying is in the nicest possible way don't think that when you graduate university with all this knowledge you're going to go straight into a second assistant role you might do which is great but it's actually better if you start as a runner or a trainee and then you learn that way um, so yeah, so just uh, with the emails, I'd say keep it, uh, keep it, don't be too formal with it. Um, put what you, uh, like what any roles that you want to be in, and I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, brilliant. And look, so I think we probably should wrap up because we are heading toward half nine and it's at least 4,000 degrees in the room that I'm in. <laughs> I don't know how you guys are all doing, but I just... Um, Steve, sorry, Steve, can I just come in on something that Lydia's just said? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, we're actually running a uh, back to member uh, only webinar next week with Sarah Putt, and she's uh, one of the biggest kind of agents uh, in, in the industry on, uh, on how to network. 
Um, so uh, the information around that will be going out in an all member email towards Thursday or Friday. But if you can come to that, you definitely, definitely should because she is amazing and she will tell you exactly the same as what Lydia's just said in terms of like, you know, what to do and what not to do. And she's also going to be running a, like a section of that on um, online and Zoom uh, networking, which we're all obviously going to be doing uh, for the next couple of weeks. So uh, thanks. Thanks for letting me coming in. Can we let me come oh, that's in great. That? It's beautifully serendipitous. Um, so and there's, there was there's a couple of things that I just love to mention just to wrap up. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for giving their time and their knowledge and expertise and for also just being so open and having such a lovely conversation. It's been really nice and it's been a pleasure to get to talk to you all. Uh, so thank you for that, guys. Um, in terms of back to, I just obviously want to say a huge thank you to Nia Hughes. Uh, and, and I also want to thank Steve Little, who is sort of hiding in the shadows, but is the, was the brains behind this and has been the brains behind a lot of what's been happening in post-production uh, via the rough assembly within back to, and um, it's, uh, you know, it's making our industry better. So we're very grateful for that. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back2, you can join for five pounds per month if you're not working, and you can join for 750 a month if you are. And all you've got to do if you're interested in becoming a member is get in touch with the membership team, which you can do via the Back2 website. Uh, so I want to list phone numbers and email addresses and whatnot, but you can find everything you need to know on the website. Um, so look, thanks so much for, for um, for sitting through this with us and thanks for all the thoughtful questions that came in through the q a as well um sorry we didn't get to everything but we got to hopefully uh, a lot of them um so i'm going to wrap up and say goodbye uh, <laughs> thanks thank for you them. steve yeah, sam robert james lydia and louise uh, and i look forward to us hopefully being able to do something like this in the same room at the same time in the future and maybe to go for a pint afterwards rather than waving at each, other, at each other from our homes. But uh, thanks a million and thank you, Nia. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, it's uh, it's actually amazing uh, what the post-production and facilities branch have put on. I'm like flabbergasted every week at uh, the talent that we uh, we have on these webinars. So thank you for your time. Thanks to everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, and please join us for next week where we will be covering short form editing. So uh, Steve, Joe, Louise, James, Robert, Sam, and Lydia, thank you so much. And also once again to Steve Little for putting it all together. <laughs>